What excites you about marketing? I think what excites me about marketing is that, to me, marketing is about connecting with an audience and connecting a film to an audience. And from my perspective, and because I mostly work with filmmakers, and so it's the crucial thing to when you've made a film to getting people to see it. Um, and it's also within marketing and distribution, um, which are usually linked together for obvious reasons. And people complain about distribution. It's actually, to me, distribution is relatively easy and has been for some time now. It's marketing that's hard. Um, what the hardest thing is, is that we have a, we're in an age of abundance. There's all kinds of content plus other things for people to engage with. And you as a filmmaker or as an artist or any person, entrepreneur, you have to break through that noise that people are surrounded by every day. And, um, and the, the key thing about that, I mean, I have a system that I talk about this, but you know, you're not just trying to break through the noise, but you're trying to break through the noise to the audience for your particular film, for instance or music or art. And while you might think that the audience is everyone, it generally isn't and never is. And um, so it's important to understand and part of marketing is understanding who your audience is and then how do you connect with them. And then also what va understanding what value you provide to them. It's not, you have to kind of think positively in terms of like, what are you providing for people so that people um, will engage with you and engage with your content, essentially want to see your film. So, When we last spoke to you in 2013, 2014, you mentioned that you tend to have a Pollyanna-ish outlook on things. Uh, is that the same now? Well, <laughs> that's so funny. Did I actually say that? Um, uh, I would say it's, yeah, because I think my fundamental belief is that every film has a path. And even as the system is broken now, the system ultimately, and I'm in these distribution think tank dis discussions, and you know, what's, you know, people talk about it being broken, but what we have to always remind ourselves is that it's been broken for at least 15 years, you know, at least since 2007 and potentially before, you know. Um, and so, uh, People have been, and I think what people, even though the, the situation is a little tougher now, um, what we are standing on the shoulders of, of people who have been experimenting with things for 15 years or even 20 years. And so there are a lot of tools and techniques that have been tried, you know, and some have failed, but many have succeeded that filmmakers, since we're mainly talking about film here, can take advantage of. And so that's why I would say I still have a positive outlook. Um, maybe not Pollyanna, not as far as Pollyanna, Pollyanna, Pollyanna-ish, yes, would be maybe a little, a little thing too far, but I, I generally have a positive out, outlook. But that's not saying that things are tough and, um, you know, that it's, you know, tougher to monetize these days if that's your goal. You know, it's just everything, there's so much more content, so it's tougher to get eyeballs. Everything's tougher. Um, but it doesn't mean that there isn't, you know, great success possible. Right, it's interesting that you say things are tough because, you know, when we first met you, there was this whole thing of the gatekeepers are gone and the democratization of film was going to change everything. So actually then there's a fallacy that that was this big floodgate opening and that these these artists no longer needed the suits. I think that, yes, and I think that, you know, I think there have always, there still are gatekeepers, you know, and there probably were gatekeepers then, but um, there were tools developing where you didn't have to defend, depend on those gatekeepers. And that's what I'm saying, those tools are even more flushed out now. And so that's why, in a sense, as I said, distribution is easy, in a sense, relatively easy. Um, you, there's many ways to get your film out into the world or your content out into the world. Um, the tough part is getting people to want to see it. But people are really doubling down now on things that 
probably should have been developed over the last 10 and 15 years that weren't developed, but now that the crisis is in a sense bigger um, and it's there's a feeling of it being more broken, um, that those that there's more people who are very smart and imaginative creating newer and more and interesting solutions that will be even more helpful to filmmakers. And I think now what's interesting is it's less on the, it feels less on the distribution side and more on the marketing side is where, and to me that's where the innovations need to come from um, because that's the toughest nut to crack. There is one thing I'll say yeah. that is a little tougher with distribution is that um, during the pandemic, unfortunately, a lot of independent art houses closed. And so that's, it's made theatrical, booking theatrical tougher because there's fewer theaters. Um, there's less quote unquote real estate out there for filmmakers to book. Hence the theaters that do exist, their shelves are full, you know, or their screens are full. They're less willing to, you know, although we work with a lot of theaters that will, you know, take our films and, um, but it, it would be, it's, it's tougher out there just because there's fewer screens. And that's, and which is a shame because there's still, I believe, a lot that can be, and not every film should have a theatrical release, but there are films that could benefit from a theatrical release that probably either, you know, either don't have the resources or even if they have the resources, it's a tough landscape to book in. Um, so that's, that's one thing I feel in, in the distribution side that's become a little tougher or significantly tougher since the pandemic. Going back to Bomb It, your documentary on contemporary graffiti, was this the first time you realized you were good at marketing? Well, probably marketing, no, because when we, myself and the two producers of Better Living Through Circuitry, we were very involved in the release of that film, even though that was with a traditional distributor. And so we were pretty involved in the marketing of that. But yeah, probably Bomb It is where I really kind of expanded my understanding of, of marketing. Yeah, probably. Distribution, I think, goes all the way back to my punk rock days. But, um, but marketing, yeah, I would say mar Bomb It. And that's natural because, you know, street art is a lot about marketing in a sense, whether and some graffiti writers would say, you know, a lot of, they're just getting their names up. It's all marketing. Like that's what they're doing. They're marketing their, their, their name. So, um, so it, it probably is a natural that that film is where I probably, you know, learned more and also probably studied it and took it more seriously and then kind of looked at in retrospect, like what I did that worked, what didn't work. And that's when kind of, when I started writing the book <clears throat> and talking to a lot of people in the industry in terms of what worked, what did, what works, what doesn't work, you know, um, so I could con convey that to other filmmakers. What was your marketing plan with Bomb at One? Oh my God, that's like, you're taking me back to literally 2008, 2009. Literally, it's 15 years ago. So I know that, um, well, okay, so I wanted Shepard Fairey to do the, the poster um, because he's great. But I also know, knew that it would be an iconic image that would help spread the brand of Vomit around. So... Um, you know, not to take anything away from Shepard's artwork and why I wanted to work with him, but also I just knew that he's a brilliant um, uh, creator of iconic imagery that like can, that just is almost like, as you say, and it, like, and he works with brands, like just you go, oh, wow, that's bomb it. That's the image in a sense. So that was part of it. And to me, part of marketing is the materials, obviously. So the trailer, the key art, um, the extra content. Um, so it's all actually starting to come back to me. So, so the key art was important. Not only the trailer, we did a couple of trailers, but not only did we do a couple trailers, we also created a lot of extra short content. So we created like probably 20 and I actually just revisited these um, because Bomb It actually, we have excerpts of Bomb It playing in a museum 
in Copenhagen for literally, I think the exhibit's gonna be two, two or three years. So I just created ex, a, a video piece of excerpts and I was originally going to use the short pieces that I made. So we made like 20 short pieces and put those online, which I actually have to reissue because we yanked them off online. We actually did a web series with, and those were purposed for a, an online company called Babblegum, which actually paid us to do that. But then they are also promoting those short content pieces. So, and then I developed a pretty good email list. So we did email list marketing. We actually, that was kind of in the heyday of affiliate marketing. So I had a lot of affiliate marketing partners that, and that was more possible in a sense back then. Now it's a little harder for film, although I think there's some new techniques that are developing in distribution that I think might bring affiliate marketing back, which is kind of exciting. And I'm actually reminding myself because I'm on a couple campaigns this summer where we might be doing these things called that Kinema is, has um, labeled film drops. And I don't know whether that's, it's kind of doing, and another company that I'm talking to this week is calling it LVOD, which is live video on demand. And it's not really quite that. It's not really TVOD, it's not really PVOD, it's not really LVOD, and it's, so film drops is the name I think, Christy's very smart from Kinema, and that's what she called it, kind of similar to a music drop. And, um, so, and I think that might bring back affiliate marketing a bit, which I think will be interesting to see how that works out. And I think we're, you know, there's a couple of campaigns I'm working on this summer that we might try that out on. So anyway, so we did affiliate marketing. We hired a publicist who did a great job. Um, and um, let's see, did we do, we had influencers. Um, even then, even before influencers were a thing, like we had a fair amount of influencers from the street art world. And then we had some partner organizations, um, but there were, there in the, in the street art graffiti world, it, there aren't really partner organizations or weren't then that you could count on, but we worked with brands. We worked with different companies and we got some sponsorship. Um, and so I think that's, for, for 14 years later, that's, or 15 years later, that's a pretty good remembrance of what, what we did. Great. One last thing though, the t-shirts. Oh yeah. You said maybe you were a, a little bit amiss with the t-shirts. No, well that's, so the t-shirts, yes. Did I say that back then too? Probably. Well, you said it was more marketed to maybe a, a woman in, you know, that would shop yeah, at yeah, Fred Siegel. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm so funny I said that. <laughs> but that's actually, to me, t-shirts are part of, are kind of a product. So it's not, it, it, in a sense, they are marketing, but we didn't create the t-shirts for marketing. We actually created stickers for marketing. So that's another thing we did is we did a sticker campaign. Um, and, um, and we also did street teams. Now that I remember, we had a pretty big street team campaign going on, um, which is a little bit, which is appropriate for some films, but not all films. Um, and I think it's appropriate for, it was appropriate for Bombit because it's, you know, a um, subculture. And I think if you have a film about a subculture, street teaming can work. But it is a little, it, I think part of it is, actually that's something I should revisit again, is street teaming. I think some projects, but it can be a little costly. And when you're on lower budgets, which most people are on these days, if you have choices in what you're gonna spend your money on, street teaming would be, I think only for certain films because there's other resources that you, other things that you would do with those resources. But getting back to the t-shirts, t-shirts can function as marketing, but we didn't do it as marketing. And in most cases, I wouldn't really recommend t-shirts as marketing. Um, I would recommend them more as merchandise, as a product to sell. And that's if you have an audience that like, if you have an audience that you think is gonna buy t-shirts to self-identify with the, with the film, um, which we did with Bomit, and I just made a mistake on my, um, you know, choosing the right product for my audience. So that was a, a lesson in that. And that's where, because we create, as you said, what I said back then was we chose t-shirt material that was for the wrong audience and that we should have chosen the thicker t-shirt material, which was for our, core audience. And then it was also, I did make a decision at, at one, one time, like, do I want to be making and selling t-shirts or do I want to make films? And because uh, getting deep into merchandise is a whole nother thing. 
Um, and if you have a team and, you know, for your film, like I'm consulting on a film about uh, beach, pro beach hockey um, and, um, and merch is a huge thing for them. And a couple of other films that merch is a huge, will be a huge thing for, for those particular films. But, um, but it's not necessarily, you know, something that's for every film. The thing about merchandise is, do you have an audience that is like a collector type audience or an audience that you feel will want to um, have something um, to remember the film by? And, um, and is t-shirts that object in a sense? Um, and I know, well, you know, we did, the film that I worked on about um, Nazarene Sotoday, who's an Iranian human rights activist, and they produced t-shirts, you know, for free. And that was part of marketing, but part of the goal of that film was to keep Nazarene alive um, in the Iranian prison system. And by having people from all over the world wearing free Nazarene shirts, you know, that helps. You know, it helps, you know, convey a message. So, anyway. What did you learn about yourself after the release of Bombit? Huh. Um, well, I guess the key thing I learned about myself was, you know, that I enjoyed this other part of filmmaking, which is distribution and marketing, and that I had a knack for it, and that I had a knack for creating a system of how to make that work and convey that to other filmmakers. Um, because I never, even though I had dabbled in distribution and marketing prior to that, I never kind of got so immersed in it and realized that, oh, I actually do enjoy this process of connecting a film to an audience. And I actually have a skill set in that. And I also have a way of seeing it systematically so that, and in a way that I can help other filmmakers with what they're struggling with. And so that's probably the thing I think that I would say I fundamentally learned the most and has kind of been a large part of my life since then. Um, and, you know, sometimes completely taking over my life, I would say. Did you learn about any Achilles heels you had regarding uh, what you thought maybe your strengths were? That's so funny because when I interview interns and assistants, I always have a question, what are your strengths and what are your weaknesses or what, do you, what are your strengths and what do you feel you need to work on more? And so it's funny that you're giving me the strength weakness <laughs> question. Okay, we didn't know that. No, it's, <laughs> that was just... Uh, no, no, no. It's just, it's funny because it's, yeah. Um, well, I think the weakness, the immediate, the thing that comes immediately to mind is work, is work, work balance in a sense and or work-life balance, or in this particular case, working, helping other filmmakers versus staying, a, staying and being a creative person. Um, so that's, that's the tension that I'm often dealing with. And because I enjoy working with other filmmakers, it's also part of how I earn my living in a sense, um, but I also want to retain and stay being a creative person. So over the years since Bomit, you know, I made Bomit 2. Um, and then I also have been a consulting producer or co-producer on a number of other projects and then even a full producer on a couple of other films. And so, and then for the last five years, I've been developing a documentary, uh, feature documentary about Mark Pauline and his group Survival Research Laboratories that he started. These are um, the robotic performance artists that I worked with back in the 80s. And so it's now almost five years ago I've started that documentary, shooting that documentary. And so that's ongoing. And then I've also been developing a doc series. And then also, as, I, as you know, I, um, about a year ago, I started doing a podcast about people's psychedelic experiences. And um, <clears throat> one of the reasons I did that is because, you know, documentaries are such a, take so long and are so dependent on fundraising and, or can be dependent on fundraising and dependent on other people and circumstances. 
And um, like the doc series we've been developing, you know, we optioned the book two years ago and, and now it's coming to, we're about to, you know, finish a deck for it and go out and pitch it. And, you know, those processes are long, whereas podcasts are, as you know, and this might be up in two weeks, can be a much faster, facile way of communicating and being creative. So um, that's a long answer to your question. But um, I would say, yeah, that's the, that's the thing that I probably is a, is, is the one of the big in the related struggle is just wanting to do too much and so it's so funny i have a tarot reader that i that i every i do at the beginning of every year and the and she uses tarot but other cards and um she uh, well, i'm trying to remember the first card she pulled um yeah so the first card she pulls at the beginning of this year is stress management <laughs> And it's so funny at the time I was going, no, I think I've, I'm managing, you know, work, work balance and work life balance. And when I say work, work balance, I mean, you know, working with other filmmakers in my own work and then work life balance is then having a life outside of both of those aspects of work. And, um, you know, it's just, I have, you know, the, the amount of things I'm trying to do now just sometimes feels um, I sometimes think I must be insane um, with everything I try to do. Um, but, you know, it's like you're here, you have one life. So, you know, why not make the most of it?